final stretch of that so cliche. This is week six of a six-week series, so we're going to be, uh, uh, this will be the end, and then we'll begin a new series uh, next week. We've been looking at cliches often used by Christians, sometimes even by non-religious people, and they will throw these phrases out sometimes just because they're not sure what to say, maybe to comfort somebody, maybe to, to just, it's a quick answer to a problem. And we've been examining those and, and kind of uh, putting them up against Scripture and saying, are these true? And, and sometimes it's complicated because there's some truth in it. And so we kind of get maybe confused. And so we've been, we've been just saying, okay, well, let's look at each one and, and find out, is this worth using? And, uh, and then in, what we've been doing is just kind of saying, you know, each time this isn't worth using and kind of deleting it, scrubbing it from our vocabulary. And so the next one, this last one, I want us to read together. It's on the screen. Are you ready? Let's read it out loud together. God helps those who help themselves. So show of hands, how many of you have heard this before? Okay, well, that's pretty universal, right? You've heard that, and um, that is used quite often. Um, it was, uh, there was Jay Leno was doing one of his um, jaywalks with the microphone, goes out to the, uh, just on the street, and was asking people, what are one of the Ten Commandments? And this was one of the most common responses that people gave. <laughs> You know, oh yeah, the Ten Commandments, God helps those who help themselves. Now, this is not in the Ten Commandments, in case you were wondering. And the Barna Group, which is a kind of like a Gallup uh, organization, but they do more uh, religious type of surveys, and they, they asked uh, hundred, thousands of people, it's an older survey, and they said, uh, which one of these is in the Bible, is a verse from the Bible? And they gave them options, this was one of them. 81% of all Americans thought, God helps those who help themselves is an actual verse in the Bible, 81%. And 53% were strongly convinced that it was a major message of Scripture. God helps those who help themselves. Now, this is not a, this is not a Bible verse. You can't find this uh, in the Bible. And um, where it comes from is really goes, dates all the way back to the 5th century B.C. in Greek mythology. Not in this exact form, but something similar to this. And then we see it throughout history in different forms. The way we see it today was popularized by Benjamin Franklin. The, he, he started a, uh, an almanac called Poor Richard's Almanac. And it was in 1736, Franklin uh, put this in. He actually had adopted this pseudonym, Poor Richard, but he was the author. And he put this phrase in, God helps those who helped themselves. And that kind of just took off, and, and a lot of people have used it over the, over the years. Now, does this phrase capture what the Bible teaches? And so we're going to look at that. I want to answer it by saying this, and this is kind of the, the, the message in a nutshell. In one sense, it does, but in two senses, it absolutely does, is opposite of what uh, the Bible teaches. It's unbiblical in every sense of the word. So we're going to kind of break it up in, those, in, those, uh, in, the, in that way. One sense it does. Because there's a part of it that kind of makes sense to us, right? When we say God helps those who help themselves. When, uh, when I sit down at dinner with, uh, with Sharon and myself, or if one of our kids are with us, and we pray and we thank God for the meal, that, that meal doesn't just like it's not like there's an empty table and then we thank God for the meal and all of a sudden the meal's there. I mean, that'd be kind of cool, right? But that's not how it works, right? We know, you know, and so what am I thanking God for? If I'm thanking him for this meal, what, what, what's really going on there? Well, I'm thanking God for the ability to, uh, to earn a paycheck, to earn ability to make some money. And, and then that, and then I'm thanking God for a planet that has resources on it that, 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 uh, that, abundance grows, food grows, and there's farmers that are, that, are, that are working hard to make that food, and then truckers that bring it to the grocery stores, and, and then people that handle it at the grocery stores, and, and then ultimately I have to go, or Sharon has to go, and we go get some of that product, and then we work and, and make the meal and put it in front of us. But when we're thanking God, we're, we're thanking God for, for, for all of those things, not that it just magically appears. So there's a part of it that kind of makes sense. We're saying, okay, well, God gives me those provisions, but I have to work to make it happen, right? So in one sense, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's true. People that are unemployed figure this out. If you're unemployed, 
uh, there's a part where you just need to pray and say, God, help me to get a job. But if you just lay on the couch, you don't do anything. That's a problem, right? I mean, you need to take the time to update your resume, to have a good resume, to go and put your resumes out and go online and fill out applications and, and then go and have interviews and talk to the person interviewing, the HR person, and convince them that you're the very best person to be hired for this job. And you, I mean, and, and you dress up and you take a shower and all the things that go into it. You know, to, you, you play your part. So you prayed, but you also worked at it and together it comes together and god blesses that and so there's there's a lot of examples of that there's people in our church that speaking of you know people that are unemployed there's a guy who who's unemployed and he and he was talking to me. he kept coming and saying hey i need prayer again i you know I'm, I, I i i need a job and i was happy to pray with him but after a while i said well tell me exactly what's going on and he 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 did some of the things right but what happened is every time he drove to actually put his application in or get an interview or do an interview, he, he, would, he wouldn't make it there. And I'd say, well, what do you mean? He'd go, well, there's a roadblock, and I'm sensing that God doesn't want that job for me. Or, or you know, and he had always had something, too many potholes in the street. And, you know, and I think that, you know, maybe that's a spiritual thing going on. You know, and, and, and well, I said, well, you know, you got to, maybe God just wants you to, maybe that's the devil. You know, maybe that roadblock, maybe that's the devil and you're supposed to go past it, you know, just gun it right through the roadblock. <laughs> you don't want advice from me. I don't always give the best <laughs> advice. But there's that part where we have to do our end, right? Where we got to work and then, and we pray and they go together. There's a lot of people like, like that guy I described, people that ignore their realtor's advice they're the expert but they said no no i want to sell my house at this price and they ask too much and then it sits there for months and months and months and then there's praying oh i just you know i i, I need it to sell well you know have you ever thought of taking the advice of your realtor they're the professional well no no i need more money than that well then i hope you're okay sitting on it for years you know because it's not going to sell that's not how it works people that pray for good grades and then there's an element of working for that, right? You've got to crack the books, turn the TV off. People that pray to lose weight and they continue to eat more calories than they burn. People that want to win some kind of competition, but they don't take the time to discipline their bodies. Practice that goes into the success. People that want a good marriage. And they're not willing to go to the hard work of sowing into that marriage, sowing into that relationship, reading the books, going to the seminars, spending you know, time in conversation you just want it to magically happen it just doesn't work like that so we we intuitively know hey there's an element in one sense this is true we are to pray and work we're to pray and work now this phrase actually is a famous phrase the benedictines it goes all the way back to that ora et labora it's it's that's latin for pray and work and they taught that as part of the disciplined christian life is to pray and to work. We do both. God gives us a brain. God gives us strength. God gives us wisdom. He gives us other people that influence us, that we can influence others. And so we, we pray, but we also are very involved in the process that God has us in. The Apostle Paul was preaching the gospel to some new Christians uh, in the Aegean Sea area there in Thessaloniki. And there, and he had started that church in Thessaloniki and, and had taught about what it meant to be a new Christ follower and, uh, and, that, and, and how Jesus, part of, the, part of what we believe is that Jesus says that he will return and he taught about that, that we never know the time, uh, that it'll be like a thief in the night. And so some of those new believers, they decided, well, he could come any moment. I might as well not even work. I'll just go ahead and just wait for the second coming. And so they quit their jobs. And so he, he writes to them uh, and addresses that. He says, uh, when we were with you, we were giving you this command. If anyone does not work, does, doesn't want to work, they shouldn't eat. We hear that some of you are living an undisciplined life. They aren't working, but they are meddling in other people's business. By the Lord Jesus Christ, we command and encourage such people to work quietly and put their own food on their table. So he's addressing all of the issues, not just the issue of 
why some of them were quitting, but if they had a bad work ethic or whatever, he just said, hey, you need to work to put food on the table. If you're not even willing to do that, let's see if a little hunger won't motivate you. And he says, both are important. Pray and work. Ora et labora. Both of these are important. 1965, blacks were fighting for their right to vote in the racial South. In Alabama, on Sunday, March 25th, close to 8,000 people assembled at Brown Chapel AME Church, and they prayed. They came together and they prayed for justice, that they would have the right to vote. But then it didn't stop there. Then they decided to march. And they marched what is now called the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights Trail. And they, they, they marched 54 miles all the way to uh, Alabama there. And there they, they listened to Dr. King give a speech. They had a rally. Then they went to the Governor Wallace and gave him a petition. Of course, that became a key catalyst in the civil rights movement, which they're celebrating this year is the 50th anniversary of that. And, 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 and it was, they prayed, but they also put, their, put something to practice. You know, they worked. They did something about it. And so there is this element that we know into it. You know, just we look around. That's how life works. That's how we change things around us is we pray and then we do something about it. We get up and we, 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 we get involved. But there's two senses where this is absolutely incorrect. Very, very fundamentally unbiblically, unbiblical and wrong. And I want to look at those. First of all, God says that he does help those people who cannot help themselves. God helps those who can't help themselves physically. Now, the truth is, there's a lot of people that cannot help themselves. And, that, and that, just that physical domain. I mean, people that get are victims of natural disasters, for example. You know, with Katrina, there was a lot of people that they, were, they just couldn't help themselves. They, everything was wiped out. In some cases, they had lost loved ones. They had lost all of their stuff. They had lost their, their ability to make an income. Their job, their business was wiped out. They needed help. Of course, it wasn't nearly as severe, but there's still some, some significant damage uh, in South Carolina. Sharon and I, I was asked to speak at somebody's, uh, one of the Vineyard Church's 18th anniversary uh, two weeks ago, on, and on that Sunday is when, that Saturday and Sunday, they had two feet of rain. I was in Myrtle Beach with Sharon, two feet of rain there. That's two feet of rain is a lot of rain. And there was roads flooded out everywhere. There was, there was homes that were flooded. We weren't partic- in, in, in that area, but there was still a ton of rain. And then trying to get back was just incredibly difficult. Trying to go through 95, 95 was, 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 was washed out a big part of it. People in that situation that you know, they're, they're victims of natural disasters. They, they, uh, they can't help themselves. They need help. They need help from other people. They need help from, because from, uh, often God will use other people, right, to help meet our needs. Sometimes it's divine intervention, but many times it's just God, God helps out people. Sometimes people are, can't help themselves physically because they have an illness. Sometimes it's, you know, it's an, a, a mental illness. My brother, my, one of my older brothers, has a, uh, he still lives in Tucson, where I'm from. He is, he is schizophrenic, has been since he was diagnosed that when he was about 19. He can't help himself. He, he's unable to work. And so he lives on social security, uh, disability. He lives in section eight housing. And I, every time I go to Tucson, I, you know, I, I, I pray with him, I talk with him, but unless something changes, you know, it's been years and years, decades, and he's just unable to help him. He's unable to work. So that's something different, where somebody's just unable, and yet they need help. They need other people to help them out. And they, they, need, God's, they need God's help as well as God using, you know, placing people in their lives to help them. Now, I want to specifically talk about uh, two areas that where people physically cannot help themselves many times, and they need help. One is, is the poor. Now, each week, each month, we provide food for people through our food pantry. It comes from the, the financial support that Vineyard Community Church is you know, bringing, either giving money directly or bringing food in. We have those bags that we set up. Uh, we kind of created, uh, created that uh, an, uh, an easy way to try to remind people. Some of you just bring food in and that's great. Others of you, you take those black bags. We ask you to just throw it in your car, leave it in your car when you go shopping. Take the bag in with you. It's got a little list of some of the things we, we currently need. 
and you just either grab one item or grab several items off of that list or something else that you think that you, you, you know, that you would like, you know, if you were in a situation where you needed some food, throw it in that bag and then just put it in on that shelf, grab an empty bag. Just, that was just, this is just one way we tried to create a way that you could easily participate. But poor, you know, people are not always poor. Sometimes people that are in a poor, you know, that are poor, uh, economically disadvantaged, sometimes it just happened to them. Sometimes they can't just get out of it. You know, we, there's a, a fair amount of people in, in, in our community that stand at street corners and they're asking for, for help. And, you know, it's easy to look at, you know, they mostly you have a sign, you know, you know, something, God bless you, is usually part of it. And they're, they're, they need help. But if you've ever talked to somebody and said, you know, I want to help one of those, you find out they're usually in a pretty tough spot. They're, they're homeless. And so if, you, if they go to fill out an application to get a job, they don't have an address to put down. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, it's hard for them to, to, they're in a pit. They're in a tough spot. They don't have a cell phone number usually that they can put down and say, call me. They have no way transportation to get to the job. They, if they show up, they don't have, you know, their clothes smell, they smell. They, they're, they're ungroomed. They have no way of getting the training. So, I mean, I don't want to make you feel bad, but you know, there's nothing wrong with rolling your window down and giving them a couple bucks either. I mean, the thing is, is we, sometimes we need to, we, we're in a place where we need help. And the people we serve, some of them are homeless, some of them are not. Some of them are just in a very, very difficult spot. And they come in and, and they need help. And I, I'm so thankful that our church ha, has decided we're, we're not going to just be on the sidelines. We want to help people that are in a, in, a, in a difficult place. I was leaving out of the building... A, I guess it was about two months ago. And as I was leaving, somebody was coming in. It was, it was a, a, a couple, and they had a bag of groceries. And I said, hey, so, you know, I just kind of made conversation. Hey, what's going on? You know, and they said, oh, well, we're bringing this bag of groceries into the food pantry. We used to be one of the receivers. We always came, and you guys were here for us. And now we've got a job. We're in a different place in our life, and we get to be a privilege now to serve other people. And sometimes it, 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 it goes like that. It's people people are in a space in their life sometimes when they just need help. Leviticus 23, 22 says, when you reap the harvest of your land, God's talking to the farmer, he says, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. So this is a command that God gives. And he says, when you're, when you're, um, as a farmer, when you're gleaning the field, when you're, when you're harvesting, leave the edges. He doesn't say, get it all and then give some to the poor. No, he's, he's, he's keeping the dignity of the poor, saying, let, they can work for theirs, but leave some for them. And then they get to go and work and, and, and get some of their, uh, you know, help them out. So God's giving instruction. These people can help themselves, and he's saying, here's the way to help them out. Sometimes I think it's interesting when we talk about helping the poor. I'll hear this phrase from time to time. Jesus said this, the term, he said, uh, uh, the poor you will have with you always. And, and, and I hear that phrase and sometimes it just, it doesn't sound right to me. I mean, it sounds like, to me, when I read between the lines, it sounds like, oh, well, you sound like you're overwhelmed and you don't feel you can really make a difference. And so and that's not what Jesus was trying to communicate with that. But sometimes we we, we feel overwhelmed. Well, will my little amount make a difference? And I've got so many unmet needs already you know, the poor, they're going to, we're going to have, they're always around. Well, that's true, but that is not at all what Jesus was saying. He was just talking about kingdom priority. It's just people were kind of getting their priorities and he's saying, hey, there is going to be poor, but there's so many times, not just in Jesus. I mean, look at how many times Jesus himself cared for the poor, reached out to the poor. They had a ministry to the poor and, so, and all throughout scripture, not just the Old Testament, all in the New Testament as well. Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats, that parable there, or the good Samaritan among many other parables those are talking about how we need to care for people that are that are less in, in, a, in a disadvantage less fortunate than us and that it actually is something that we are measured on in our faith we james talks about how we have saving faith but our saving faith is always manifested in practical helping out people around us it goes hand in hand now our food pantry feeds 394 uh, people per month. That's about 90 families a month. And we 
get a chance to make a difference. Here's a couple stories. Mrs. Lauren, she's one of the, the people that comes to our food pantry. She's retired and she's in her late 60s. She only has Social Security coming in and has a son in his 40s that she helps because he was in a motorcycle accident and now he is challenged. She comes to the pantry every month to pick up food for herself and her son. By coming to our pantry, she can save her money to pay for some, some of her, her, her utility bills. And uh, each week, every time she comes in, we pray for her, pray for her son. She comes, she needs it. She, it's, it's, it here's another person, her, Kelly. She first came when she was in a need of, she, she, she didn't have a place to stay, didn't have a car, didn't have a job. We've been praying for her for a while and giving her food. God answered our prayers with her determination of not giving up. She now has an apartment, a job, and a car. She came back last week with a plant as a gift. To the, and this is just written this week, so that just happened just last week. With a plant as a gift to the food pantry volunteers just to say thank you and that she will not need to come to the pantry anymore. We have a grandmother that comes by to pick up food for her grandchildren that are living with her. There's no father, no daughter, and the daughter is in, incarcerated. And the church is one of her key supports for the needs that she has. And there's a number of men that come because they've lost their jobs recently and they're in a rough time. And so there's these, pe these people have names, these people have stories. They're in a, many times it's just a season of life we're able to intersect. We're actually kind of the hand of God in a way. It's kind of awesome. Proverbs says in 1917, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Pretty stern in, there in Proverbs 21, 13. And then those who are generous are blessed for they share their bread with the poor. So God does help those who help themselves when we can and when we're supposed to, but many times we can't. We are in a situation in life where we can't help ourselves, and yet God will help us. And one of the ways he does it is through, through the, the compassion of his people. So what I wanted to do uh, is to take a, set, a special offering now, and uh, the, it was mentioned in the status update. I don't know if you caught it. You don't have to give if you don't want. I, I'm not trying to guilt you out. We don't really do this very often, right? But I just think it's a, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to put um, faith into action by giving uh, to the poor. Now, you know, it is different in the Bible. If you look in the Bible about ways of giving, there's our tithes that we give. And then there's special offerings that we give. And then Jesus says, he kind of separates giving to the poor. He, there's a separate name for it. It's called alms. And in alms, he says, you shouldn't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. That's, that's what that's. Sometimes people think that's all giving. No, he's talking about alms. He's talking about giving to the poor. He's talking about keeping the dignity of the poor. And so you may not know all of the people that, that are, that are going to be benefited from it, but we, what, we're going to take this money. We'll go down to the food, food bank. We'll buy food at very, very cheap rates. All of that's done with volunteers. They come in, they serve, they pray for them. And so I would like to challenge you right now to, to just to give to the, to the poor. So if the ushers can come forward, I'm going to give as well. I'm going to do it through uh, Easy Tithe because that's an easy way to give. We actually have uh, a, 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 um, a way to do that. Uh, we actually have one of our listings is giving uh, to the poor. Or actually, I'm just, I think it's food pantry, but it'll, it'll make it there if you put uh, alms. Okay. As we're taking the offering, I wanted to show you we have a new director. Ms. Shirley has been our director of the food pantry for years. As I said, they were, she was a volunteer. This new one is. I want to show you a picture of her. This is Shandy Waterman and her family, but Shandy's the one who's going to be our food pantry director from this point forward, and she helps organize that, the volunteers, she helps uh, go, Miss Shirley actually donated her truck so that we have a truck where we can go down each, each week and, and fill it up with, uh, with, food, with food from the food bank. Uh, we also give, as you know, you, you may not know, I don't know, we have 200 turkeys, well actually it was mentioned in the status update, to families or, or more. We have our Christmas angel tree ministry where we help out 
families that are in need. Uh, our Christmas Eve offering, we always take a special offering for Christmas Eve and we give that uh, to the poor. Last year we gave it to the food pantry specifically. Uh, then in uh, Mexico, we have uh, sponsorships where we go down there uh, twice a year to Mexico and to Mazatlan. And there's very, very, these are abject, pop, these are kids that, that we go to the very poor areas. Mazatlan obviously has a very wealthy area. That's not where we go. We go to the, the, the place where they live at the dump or in the red light district and various places like that. And we, when we provide for these kids, one of the things that you can do that, that we offer is, is that you can sponsor a kid. And uh, we have applications if you want to be part of that as on, on the way out at the uh, information desk. You can fill that out, and, and, it, and it helps one of those kids. They not only get food like you would get if you sponsored a kid through uh, one of the ones that are on TV, but they also get spiritual uh, instruction. They, get, they, they, you know, they talk about Jesus, and they give them a lot of, of, uh, of uh, spiritual direction. So we kind of pair it up because we believe it's, it's mind, body, and spirit. All, all of those are affected when, you, when you're in, when you're in uh, poverty. So that's one area that people can't help themselves. Another one is, is when they're sick, when they're sick. Now, if you've been sick and, you've, uh, and it doesn't go away and you, you've gone to uh, a healthcare professional, maybe you've gotten a quick answer, you've gotten some medication, sometimes that happens, right? You know, here's some antibiotics, boom, you know, your cough's gone. But there's sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes you don't get healed. Sometimes you don't know why. Sometimes it's real serious. Sometimes they have no idea what you have. Sometimes they have no idea how to, how to solve it. They might be able to identify it, but we don't have a cure yet. And so God is interested in, and now I'm not saying that one is man and one is God. I believe that, that healing, God, there's a lot of different ways of healing. When Jesus talks about the good Samaritan, he brought uh, anointing oil, and that day, that was a form of medication, a form of medicine. So I believe God uses medication. Uh, it, it uses people, and that's one of the ways he brings healing. Other times, it's, uh, it's, it's divine healing. Sometimes we just pray for people, and God heals them. And sometimes we don't understand it, but sometimes he doesn't, or it's delayed. And so that's that whole working out of the kingdom of God and how God's unfolding his plan. Uh, here's some great verses that talk about how God is interested in healing our sickness. Exodus 23, 25, he says, you shall worship the Lord your God and I will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from, from among you. And then James 5 says, if anyone, is anyone among you sick? It kind of just opens up with that question. Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the, per, the sick person well. And so here, here's because of what Christ did on the cross, all of a sudden we have this additional access. I mean, it's God's, it's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He, he is a God who, want, who loves to heal people. But in, in Christ, there's like, because of his stripes, we are healed. So there's this power. First Peter says, he himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So there's this, this, uh, this uh, augmentation of the kingdom of God. You know, it's interesting in um, 1 Corinthians, it talks about the gifts of the sp different gifts, a list of nine different gifts. The only one that is plural is, is, the, is the gift of healings. And so there's this kind of this idea that the body of Christ comes together. And uh, only Jesus had all the gifts of healings. No matter who he touched, no matter who he prayed for, he was able to bring healing. But, but there's this, this idea that, that God wants all of us to participate and to be part of praying for healing for people. And then here he instructs us, he says, sometimes that means laying on of hands. And so that's one of the values that we have here at the vineyard. And so if you come for prayer, you're in your small group or pretty much in any circumstance, because we, we just believe in laying on our hands that, that people will say, now, we always ask permission. Hey, is it okay if I lay hands on you? And Because, uh, you know, everyone's got their bubble, right? They all got their bubble. So, so we, we want to we just pray on them. Pray, pray and just say, God, bless them. Bring healing. And these two areas, uh, caring for the poor, compassion ministry, and praying for the sick, praying for those who are sick, are two core values of the Vineyard USA, all the vineyards, actually vineyards all over the world. I mean, that, this is, these are two things that in any vineyard you go to will be core values that we, that, we, that we believe in and we practice. 
So, as I said, in one sense, we get it. You know, God does help those but, who help themselves. But in, in, in another sense, God helps those who cannot help themselves physically. And then another way is just spiritually. You see, God saves and delivers people that make a mess of their lives. When they found themselves in the, walking in the valley of the shadow of death, when they're in a hopeless situation, helpless, when they're distraught, God comes alongside us and he injects hope into a hopeless situation. He injects life into something we only see in death. He, he redeems things, that relationships that are broken and, we, and they seem like they're, 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 it's all over. All we can see is the negative. Now, when God helps us in that situation, when we don't deserve it, when we can't earn it, that's called grace. Right? Grace. Grace is receiving the blessings of God when we don't deserve it. And he just, he, and that's part of who God is. He loves to show grace. We don't deserve it. We don't, and that holds so many people back because they don't understand grace. I'll talk to people and they'll say, you know, that have become Christ followers and, and yet they don't get water baptized. I'll say, what's going on? Well, you know, I'm not ready for that. You know, and they'd start talking about, you know, I still, I still curse. I still do this. I still smoke. I still do this. I, I still, I, I have these things I'm working through. I still yell at people. And, uh, and I just encourage them and say, hey, you know, that's what grace is all about. We keep, I mean, we just, we enter into the kingdom, not by our works, but through grace. Then they get, they get enough courage. Sometimes they'll go get baptized. A number of people I have baptized, and we do it out at the ocean sometimes, and they'll kind of lose their footing, and then they'll curse right before they get baptized. <laughs> I'll go, see, it's by grace you're here, you know. <laughs> And they're in the process of sanctification. They're in the process of God doing something in their life. And we just kind of, you know, that's part of it. That's part of, now, when God meets our needs, we, have, we do have spiritual needs. Now, we have physical needs. If you remember in your high school uh, psychology class, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The hierarchy of needs is in a pyramid. And uh, there it is. The very bottom of the pyramid, of course, is our basic needs. You know, air, food clothing, shelter. You'll be glad to know even sex is on there. That's a core need, you know? Most, I'm not sure. That was Abraham. I'm not, Bertha was his wife. She probably thought, you know, Abraham, I'm not sure that needs to be on there. We, oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, modern, I was looking online, and, and now people are saying there's another need they need to add. It's Wi-Fi, you know? There's, it's a, there's a screen for that, right? <laughs> And then somebody else put on there, even more than that, a battery, you know, that's, you know, your battery life. But we do have core needs. We have, and, 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 and those needs we were talking about, but then there's these other needs of knowing that you have a purpose in life and that you're fulfilling that purpose and that you have a sense of love and belonging and that you have value and worth and esteem. And those are higher level needs in that sense. But they're, they're, we, they're really spiritual needs. And God wants to meet those. And when we make a mess of things and we lose our way, grace, still God says, I still, I still want to use you. I still want to bring blessing to you. I still want to bring mercy into your life. There was a, a gal, she was passing away. She wasn't that old, actually. She, I think she was in her 60s. She came to our church. And because she had this serious illness, she came to Christ. And then as she was towards... You know, I was visiting her in one of, one of our last visits. She was saying, you know, I, she was a medical doctor. And she said, I live for my job and my prestige and, and, all, and the good life. And now that I'm in the situation I'm in, I'm looking back. I'm realizing I missed the most important things in life. And I wish I hadn't done that. And, and we can get sucked up into that. It's particularly here in, in, you know, our country. It's one of the wealthiest countries on earth. There's so many things that, that dangle out there and sparkle like lures, saying, go after this. This will satisfy that need. This will, this will fill that loneliness place. This will you know, make you feel like you have meaning, like you have like you purpose. And it's easy to follow that pathway. But God, he wants to come in and he wants to say, no, listen, do you want to really feel you, like, you, like you have purpose, like your life matters? Have your life filled with love and, and a sense of, uh, you know, esteem and, and, and value. That's found 
through spiritual things that God wants to pour into your life. And he does it not because we deserve it. Nothing we do deserves, do we end up deserving God to help us in that situation. But he does because he loves us. The psalmist, I think, I love this when he says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, I heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. He reached down from on high. He took me and drew me out of mighty waters. When we find ourselves in hopeless situations, in difficult places, our circumstances, we go, how, am I, how did I get here? Sometimes it's just our own mess. And so we don't even feel like we have a right to go to God and say, God, forgive me, save me out of this. But that's grace. We, we, and many times we can't. We can create such a mess for ourselves that we can't even get out of it. It's just too big of a mess. We can't help ourselves. So does God help us? He does. God helps those who cannot help themselves. He does, because he, 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 he cares and he, and he wants to. So we pray and we work. Prayer is an incredibly powerful force. That's why we're going to begin a series next week that three-week series on prayer and talk about the value and, and how that God uses that to change our lives. Talking about the power of prayer, Paul says in the Philippians, he says, do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why does God give us peace when we have anxiety, when we have things that we look at that cause us to worry and fear? Because we deserve it? No, because of grace. And so there is a sense that we need to do our part and step out in faith and say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you in this. And, and, and we do our part and then believe that God's going to help us as well. And we pray and work. But then there's another part when we just depend on God's grace to help us when we are down and out. When we're maybe, maybe economically challenged, maybe you're in a situation where you don't have a job or you know, your, your debts are so high and that's all you can see and, or, 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 or maybe you're sick and maybe you've been prayed for, but you know what I've discovered is we just keep praying and we keep praying and uh, Jesus gives a story about that, the widow who keeps going, pestering the judge, pestering the judge and finally just says to get her off my back, I'm going to give it to you and he goes, how much better is God than a judge and even a wicked judge would do that. So sometimes we just go to God over and over and say, God, I need healing. I need your touch. I need your grace. Sometimes we're just in a mess. We're in a mess spiritually. And we, can't, we don't know which way is up. We've lost our sense of purpose and what we're supposed to be doing with our life. Or maybe we never, you've never figured that out. And we, that you say, well, what do I do at that point? You go to God and say, God, I need a fresh outpouring of your grace, of your vision for my life. And watch what God does. Okay, let's stand and we'll close in prayer. This last verse, the psalmist says, lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Heavenly Father, I'm sure there's some here tonight that are pretty beat up by their circumstances. Life can dish out some pretty, pretty tough blows. If you're here tonight and you're feeling hopeless, Maybe you have despair. God wants to speak hope into your life. Thank you, Lord, for bringing these people here so they could hear about the hope that you have for them. Lord, I know you love them. And so we pray right now, Lord, help them to sense your presence. Now, would you pray? Say, God, you know how I've been feeling this week. You've seen what's going on in my soul. Just name that. Maybe it's confusion or sadness or pain. Say, today, I want to experience your fresh grace and mercy. Your unconditional love for me. Because God says he loves you unconditionally, not based on your behavior, not based on what you do. Would you say, just pray, say, God, thank you. Even in the ugly areas of my life, you love me. And you give the power to change circumstances. 
You say, God, today I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Would you say, God, I, I believe you exist. I believe you love me and that I matter to you. And I trust that you have power to change my circumstances. So moment by moment, day by day, I'm going to live with that in mind. That you love me and you have grace enough to cover everything. Then would you say, God, use me as an instrument of your love to other people. To help those in a difficult spot. To pray for somebody who needs a touch from you. Lord, thank you as we've been studying over these last six weeks and kind of maybe debunking some myths that we've bought into. Teach us, Lord, how to walk in our faith walk, in our pilgrimage in a way that would be more in line with your word. We know we're not perfect, but as it comes up, Lord, just we just pray, Lord, that just let that other stuff go aside that ballast, that dross, whatever it is, just help us to be people that want to walk in, in, uh, in, in alignment with your word. In Jesus' name, amen.